Um, and so it matters that at the core of Islam, there are principles like martyrdom and jihad. Uh, it really matters that Islam views itself as a, a religion that will be victorious in this world politically and materially. And that, that there will be a, a, a true Islamification of the planet that will pe people will either convert or die, or Christians and Jews will live as, as uh, 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 called dimmi, uh, you know, as in, in some kind of apartheid situation where they pay a, a protection tax. Uh, this is the view of moral order that you get from Islam, and it really is. It is the. It is. It's not the crazy Al Qaeda. I just went to a training camp in Afghanistan. Islam. It is. It is mainstream Islam. And one of, the, one of the problems we have uh, is that many Muslims, for, um, uh, for understandable reasons and some for really deplorable reasons, are playing hide the ball with the articles of faith and are eager to have the conversations of the sort you, you have had uh, from a very cynical and manipulative perspective. You know, we're, just, we're just going to keep having big families and eventually it's going to be Arabia and the, the war will be won. There, there, uh, there are people who really think in those terms. Uh, and they're, they're not necessarily just the people in the center of the bullseye of, of uh, Islamic infatuation. There, they can be several uh, uh, cantos out, you know, just, just, just the kind of people, people who would never blow themselves up, but who think it's a good thing that some people will. Uh, and they don't really care if they blow up non-combatants. And, and they view um, Danish cartoonists drawing images of the prophet as a moral offense equivalent to dropping bombs on people or, or uh, flying planes into buildings. And, and, so the, and these are theological grievances. And, l and much of the humiliation you talk about, which I think is worth worrying about, much of this humiliation is mediated by theological claims and beliefs and, and priorities. And, and, and certainly everything bin Laden was, was ranting about prior to 9-11 was is best seen as a, a theological concern. I mean, he was concerned about the proximity of infidel troops to Muslim holy sites. He was, he's, concern, he's concerned about the caliphate. He's, not, he's concerned about apostate, you know, bad Muslim rulers in Saudi Arabia and other countries, the insufficiently you know, devout rulers. Um, he's not he, only a, as a political opportunist has he become concerned about the fate of the Palestinians. Um, and obviously he hates the Jews and he hates the, the, the existence of Israel. Uh, but these are all, through all of this, I mean, it can be sort of bent into the language of humiliation and equal rights and a repudiation of colonialism, and it's entangled with our energy policies. And yes, I mean, there's a lot that we should get straight. Uh, but we have to realize that there is a, is a subset of the Muslim world that takes the idea of conquering the world for Islam very, very seriously. Uh, and it, we deny that at our peril. And it's like, it is different than uh, Buddhists who we might mistreat. You know, I mean, the, the Buddhists are being mistreated by the Chinese in, in Tibet. Buddhism doesn't have, I mean, it's, it's possible to get uh, Buddhist violence. I and mean, we had Buddhist violence in World War II. I mean, Zen Buddhism was very flexible in, in uh, helping to inspire the kamikaze pilots. Uh, it was kind of a Zen Shinto national war ethic. But um, it's harder to, to bend Tibetan Buddhism into a, a, a death cult. Um, and we don't have Tibetan Buddhist suicide bombers blowing themselves up on Chinese bu buses. Um, it's not, it wouldn't be impossible, but it's, it's much less likely, and it's, it's less likely because of what they believe. So my argument is there's beliefs matter, and let's talk honestly about the logical consequences of beliefs. Hi, Sam. Thank you for uh, sharing your perspective with us today. Um, I remember when I was nine years old and I was starting to depart from my Presbyterian up upbringing, and um, my sweet Southern grandmother said to me, have you found a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Um, this line kind of remains with me today. And so I wonder, is there any evidence kind of emerging from any of these studies that religious beliefs are different and that they some way connect to an emotional side of us, a side of us that, that wants to feel comforted by the universe or some kind of personal aspect? And, and if so, 
how do things like, say, MDMA or meditation or uh, substituting a more scientific philosophy, how can they kind of overcome that border of being seen as cold and impersonal and, and not connecting to that kind of? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know of any research that, that uh, has looked at that. I mean, and I'm not sure that the research we're doing now is going to be able to answer that first question. I mean, I think that, that if there's a difference between believing Jesus is the Son of God versus believing that, that uh, uh, we're up at the Salk Institute, um, it could be that we'll see uh, you know, areas of emotional processing that we don't see in, in the case of ordinary beliefs. Um, but the way we have it set up, I, I'm not sure that we'll, we'll be able to give a, a full answer to that question. But clearly, religious experiments, we don't really need neuroimaging results to know that religious experience is a major driver of uh, uh, emotion and, and reward. And there's something, and, and, it's, and fear is uh, um, kind of the backstop against which people uh, 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 keep you know, hurling their, their faith. I mean, it is the context of faith. I mean, fear about bad things happening to you in the afterlife is the, is the kind of the overarching belief that keeps all of this uh, uh, together. Um, and so, so hope and fear and, and the pleasures of certain religious practices are clearly, you know, uh, uh, a large part of, of the reasoning that, is, that, that you find in religious thinking. And it's, it's, it's why there's so much self-deception and wishful thinking and a lack of uh, real encouragement to, to uh, jettison false beliefs. I mean, it's, it's, it's how we see people's religious beliefs being compatible with anything happening to them because uh, they are, it's not just that they're non-falsifiable, it's that they are apparently confirmable by any outcome. You know, you're, you're, if you pray for someone who, who uh, gets better, that's uh, you know, a, a sign that God will listen to you and, and save that person's life. And if you pray for someone who dies, it's a sign that God, you know, for his mysterious reasons, wanted that person to come back to, to Jesus. I mean, you, so it, it's, it's, it works in either case. And people, for obviously, you know, deeply felt emotional reasons, take refuge in it uh, in either case. So, um, but ultimately, I, mean, I think if, if you could give someone a pill that, that primes their, their core, blissful, religious, uh, grace-feeling experience, and you give it to a Christian, you give it to a Muslim, and you give it to an atheist, and you, 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 you're going to find it, it driving their, their incompatible ideology, I think, in the same way. So the Muslim will feel, oh, this is, the, he'll, he'll have a, an Islamic account of what this is. The Christian will have a Christian account of what this is. Uh, uh, it seems to me that if we ran that experiment in a sufficiently clever and, and public enough way, it would cause people to doubt uh, the way in which they're framing their experience. I mean, physiology may trump ideology if, if we uh, ran an experiment that way or not. You know. Okay. It's Five o'clock. Thank you very much for being here, and thanks again to Sam. Thank you.